Hello everyone, I'm Rania Kalik and this is Dispatches. I'm thrilled to be joined by the leader of the Socialist Party of Zambia, who is running in the upcoming presidential election in August, Dr. Fred Mbembe. Dr. Fred Mbembe, welcome. Thank you. So our audience is mostly American, and as most of the world is aware, Americans aren't the best at geography. So before we get into your background and that of the platform of the Socialist Party you represent, can you tell us a little bit about Zambia? Where is the country? What's the economy? What's the political system? Who is currently in charge? And what is the kind of wealth inequality that you're dealing with there? Zambia is situated in central Southern Africa. Some say Central Africa, some say Southern Africa. Uh, it's uh, got neighbors, Angola, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, and Congo, DRC. Mm. And then it's not very far away also from South Africa. Uh, it became independent in 1964 from British colonial rule. Its economy is dependent mainly on copper mining. It's a mining country uh, with a bit of agriculture. And Fred, you're running on a socialist platform of universal education and universal health care, as well as the expansion of housing and sanitation facilities for the masses, the promotion of cooperative farming. Um, and your party has also expressed its desire to reverse the deindustrialization process that was spurred by the neoliberal reforms introduced in 1991. So can you elaborate a little bit on your party's platform and how it's being received so far by Zambian society? Our country is very poor. We have got poverty levels running up to 82% in some regions of our country. Mm -hmm. We have rural poverty averaging 76.6%. Uh, we have very high maternal mortality rate. We have very high infant mortality rates. Uh, the literacy levels are also not that good, they are low. With such high poverty levels, the challenges are huge. It also means that, you know, we have high hunger levels. We are the fifth youngest country in the world after Central African Republic, Chad, Madagascar, and Yemen. We are the fifth youngest country in the world. When you have that, it means you have challenges with malnutrition, both infant and adult malnutrition. It also means that you have got a very high death rate. It also means you have high unemployment levels. Everything is out of control. And to that, add the COVID situation. You are, not, you are definitely not prepared. With such high poverty levels, the spread of COVID and this control are problematic. You were talking about some of the things in your party's platform and we mentioned universal health care. So the promise of the investment in universal health care takes on even more urgency in light of the pandemic. Can you tell our listeners and viewers how the current healthcare system in Zambia has fared against COVID-19 and do you believe the program that you're promoting could help in a future pandemic? I was saying where you have rural poverty levels averaging 76.6% and where you have also very high general poverty levels, you have very high hunger levels. Keeping basic hygiene is a problem. When housing is poor, when sanitation is poor, water supply is poor, to keep the health of the people is very, very difficult and very expensive. Mm. You have queues and queues at clinics or hospitals. Unless you deal with those, you cannot reduce the burden on the health system. No matter how much medicines you supply, there will be long queues there will be very high demands for medicines. Medicines cannot be a substitute for food. You need to provide people with the basic things that they need to keep a health life. 
and then medicine supplements that or takes care of the divergences from that. So we have serious challenges. And also high, uh, poor levels of education are difficult to deal with health services. When you, do have, you do not have sufficient levels of education, people cannot even read prescriptions from the doctor. That's a good point. And you guys have and, a policy. You guys are, you are yes. promoting a platform for universal education as well. Yes. Even a mother with very low levels of education can really look after a child, a baby in the 21st century. It becomes a huge challenge also. Can you tell us what is the history of leftism in Zambia, of socialism in Zambia, and the legacy of someone like Kenneth Kwanda? Uh, Zambia's first president, who was at the forefront of the struggle for independence from the British. Uh, what is his influence, as well as the history and legacy of socialism in your country? Kenneth Kaunda led a very strong anti-imperialist movement. He participated heavily in the liberation struggles of Southern Africa and in other parts of Africa. In that regard, he was a revolutionary. We socialists we should not think we are the only revolutionaries. People who sacrifice everything to liberate their people from imperialist domination, colonial domination, are also revolutionaries. But we socialists, of course, are the only revolutionaries who can carry out a socialist revolution. So I would say Kenneth Kaunda was a revolutionary. He took a strong anti-imperialist position and he pursued the poly progressive policies in the non-aligned movement. He sided with the progressive elements there. He also played a progressive role at the United Nations, played a progressive role at the African Union or the Organization for African Unity, as it was called then. Uh, he was a friend of many revolutionaries. He was a friend of Oliver Tambo, leader of the African National Congress. He kept him at, the, at his residence during the liberation days. He was a friend, a very close friend of Samora Machel. He was a very close friend of Julius Nyerere. He built a good relationship or a good friendship with Fidel, especially toward the end of his days in government. He got very close to, to Fidel uh, and, and Cuba. He was a very close friend of Yasser Arafat. That's a he really was really yeah. great group of yeah. people <laughs> to be yes. friends with. Yes. He was a, a very good friend of NASA. He was a good friend of Nkrumah. So he associated himself with progressive people. He also got close to Martin Luther King in the early days. They shared some platforms. So um, he was progressive. Quite so. And, uh, you know, I, it, he had clearly had quite an influence on you as well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your background politically and professionally. Um, what shaped your politics? You grew up in the Southern Afri in the South African socialist movement. You were the founder of The Post in Zambia, the first non-government owned newspaper, which was ultimately shut down by the government. So can you tell us about that, about your background and what influenced you in a left direction? In the left direction, my influence came from the South African Communist Party mm. or the Communist Party of South Africa, as it was called then, and the African National Congress. I joined the South African Communist Party in 1978 and uh, I grew up there. I had access to very good people. Joe Slovo, Chris Hani, Ben Turok, and many others. Uh, so the ANC and the South African Communist Party shaped my political outlook. You cannot look for a better school than that. <laughs> I think they had, they had the best revolutionaries on the continent, born out of a long and a very, very difficult struggle. I think they're the best human beings I met in my life. 
you cannot look for better teachers than Joe Slovo. You cannot look for better inspiration than Christian. It was a huge privilege to have known those great revolutionaries of our continent and of our world. You know, your party blames the neoliberal policies, uh, neoliberal policies for creating a situation where, quote, this is from your manifesto, I believe, nearly half of the population has no access to clean water at all. So can you tell us what was the impact of the structural adjustment policies on Zambia? And just for those who are who are watching and don't know, structural adjustment was a uh, a series of austerity policies that were imposed on post-colonial countries in the developing world by the IMF and World Bank throughout the 1980s and 1990s to devastating effect. So Fred, how did those policies impact your country politically and economically? The structural adjustment programs that we pursued over the last 30 years, or the neoliberal policies that we pursued over the last 30 years, meant that social services were hit hard. Mm. Profit was emphasized much more. We got back to what uh, is termed the triple down economics, mm. which uh, the current Pope Francis is very, very much opposed to. Uh, we got to an economy that benefited private capital other than uh, the people. And being uh, an extractive, an extractive economy where it's heavily dependent on mining, the people did not benefit. And the technology has also changed. Whereas in the olden days, mines employed more people. Today with technology, they're employing fewer and fewer and fewer people, meaning levels of unemployment arise. There's very little people are getting. They used to get some small wages from the mines. Now they don't get them because they don't get jobs there, which means they are not getting much out of mining. And the taxation system is poor. The government is not collecting sufficient or fair taxes from the mining activities, which means the transnational corporations that are mining, they are, extract, they, are, they are making huge and huge profits. The country is losing out on literally everything. Sounds like a we are, story. Yes, we had a free educational system. We have lost that in a very big way. We had free health services. We have lost that over the last 30 years. We had agriculture that was well supported, especially peasant agriculture, with the cooperatives and so forth. We have lost most of those cooperatives. We have lost that, uh, that good support to peasant agriculture. We have lost our educational system in terms of free education. When you have poverty levels of 82% in a region, how can people be able to pay for education? Such poor people. When you have 76.6% in rural poverty, how do you expect those poor people to pay for education? It means the poor are becoming poorer and poorer and are increasing in the numbers. While the population is not stagnant, it's growing. We have a population growth rate of 2.93% per annum. Our current population is 18.3%. In 15 years' time, we expect that population to more than double, to at least double. How are we going to provide education for the doubled population in 15 years? Where are health services going to come from? Where is housing going to come from? Even just basic transportation, both of human beings and goods. How are you going to improve it in the next 15 years? If we continue on the same path, we have no alternative but to look for new ideas, to, new, to look for new approaches. To us, there's no other approach other than the socialist approach. The reason, you can remove the label of socialism, but keep the basic policies, the fundamentals, it doesn't matter with the labor. We can't continue on this path. Now you mentioned uh, mining. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, copper mining is one of the biggest parts of the Zambian economy. Um, mm -hmm. How does your party seek to restructure the economy to serve the working class and poor, which you just, just talked about, um, so that you can provide all those services? 
Yeah, the basic approach by leftist governments had been to nationalize everything. Mm. We are not going to nationalize the current mining. We don't have the capacity to run it. If we nationalize those mines, in no time they'll run down. They are complicated businesses with a lot of complicated supply lines. You nationalize a mine, you have not nationalized the supply lines. You find that that mine fails. Even the marketing of it. We don't have enough mining engineers. We don't have uh, mining economists. We don't have even the legal expertise required. So many things are missing. We can't even market the, the, the copper we have mined. So if we nationalize that, we are bound to run down the mines. And we have uh, more than 60 years of experience, global experience, in terms of nationalizations, both on the left and on the right. So we have seen what works and what doesn't work. Mm. So we will not rush to nationalize the mines. We will seek to extract fair taxes from them and pump what we have extracted from that into education, health, and peasant agriculture. And ensure that also the mining corporation train our people in the skills required to mine. Moreover, it's only one third of our mining potential currently under exploitation. We still have two thirds not exploited. We'll deal with the two thirds different. And most of these mining mines, you know, the remaining economic life is about eight to 40 years. Why fight for a mine that has got only remaining eight years mm -hmm. economic life? By the time you finish the negotiations and so on, the mine has closed and you, you have nationalized nothing. And we don't want also to create an unnecessary problem for ourselves. Nationalization is not a principle. It's not a principle. Our strategic goal is public ownership of literally everything. All the key sectors of the economy must be controlled by the people, must be owned by the people. But the way we arrive at that differs from place to place. And the time it takes to get there differs from country to country. The strategic objective of any socialist system is public ownership of everything, of the key means of production. But that's why socialism is a process. Right. It's not one act, it is a process. And the socialist system is a transitional system. And that transition means you have to make many compromises. You have to make many compromises with capital. Right. Any transition means you have got one foot in the future, one foot in, in yesterday, and your body in today. That's not a very comfortable situation to be in. And these are not easy compromises to make. And that's what complicates socialist construction. Being a transitional phase, socialism is a transitional system. It's not a permanent system. Transition to a publicly, a totally publicly owned system. That's not going to be easy. That's what makes the struggle difficult because now we have to fight with the transitional corporations. We have to be tactical in the way we deal with them. And the other difficult thing that you're having to deal with as well is some of the repression, right? Your socialist party is relatively new. Is there political space for socialist organizing in Zambia? And the reason I ask that because um, it appears that your campaign has in fact faced some repression. Can you tell us about that? There are many challenges for a socialist party in a neoliberal economy, in a capitalist setting. One, you will face the general repression. The capitalist system is not democratic, as we purported to say. It's not democratic. If Mobilizing for a socialist party in a capitalist setting, in a neoliberal economy, is not easy. Contrary to what they claim that, you know, the capitalist system or pro-capitalist systems are democratic, they are not democratic. They are not democratic. In fact, they are the most rep repressive regimes in the world. Generally, the space, the democratic space has narrowed. 
not only for the Socialist Party, but for all opposition elements. It's not easy. For the last three years, we were not able to hold rallies, political rallies. Wow. In the last three years, we have only held two political rallies. The rest were denied us. Right now, we are in a campaign where we are not able to hold meetings, public meetings. We are not able to, to do literally anything in terms of contact with the masses. They have utilized the COVID restrictions. Yes, we are in the middle of a very bad wave of the pandemic. Some of the measures are justifiable, but they are not being applied in a manner that is fair to all. So there are challenges. And also the resources required to run the campaigns. Radio programs, television programs, billboards, you have to pay for them. Transportation and so on. So many logistical things that you need. A socialist party is not a party that is supported by big business. You depend on the poor. Our members are very poor. They cannot even, our candidates cannot even support their own campaigns. The other political parties which are on the right, they are supported by businesses. Their candidates are rich people. Hmm. So their mobility is higher, their adverts are, are easy better. to come, yeah. Right. So we have to, try to struggle around this. The only thing that we have is uh, the majority of the people are poor. And our membership is of poor people. If the majority were poor, started to run their own affairs, started to campaign among themselves, the results can be good. We have a clear message. We have a better message than the capitalist parties for our people. And that's the greatest weapon that we have. While we lack in terms of resources, we are strong in terms of message. Mm. Let me, I, I, want, I would love to ask you about um, the foreign policy on your platform. Um, you know, what is Zambia's relationship with its neighbors? How do Zambia's struggles fit into the broader struggles of the African continent? And are there other opposition and leftist movements that you're allied with? Do you see yourselves as part of a broader wave of resistance on the African continent? A socialist revolution in Zambia alone is meaningless. Just as Kenneth Kaunda used to say, the independence of Zambia alone is meaningless until Namibia, Angola, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and South Africa become free. Without them being free, we are not free. Even the socialist agenda Zambia alone going the socialist path is not enough. Mm. Even economically, even if we did well, better than everybody else around us, that will not be good enough. We need to ensure that, you know, our neighbors also eat as we eat. Mm. Our, neighbors, our neighbors also live in peace. They have also got access to education. They have got also access to health services and so on. We are a landlocked country with eight neighbors, neighboring countries, eight borders. What goes on in these other eight countries has an impact on us. Mm. So we needed to be aware of what is going on in the other countries. But also we needed to be peaceful. Each country should be left to determine its own destiny. They must make their own choices. We want to, to have peaceful relations with all our neighbors. We will not impose our socialist policies on our neighbors. But doesn't, that, that doesn't mean if they are not socialists, we will not deal with them. No. We have to deal with our neighbors. We don't have a choice. Mm. We are in a region together with them that we can't change. And we have a history. We are same people. 
with probably the same destiny. If we do good things here, our neighbors definitely will learn about those good things and see what they can pick or what they can emulate. We will lead by example, not by force. We will try as much as possible to maintain good relations with all our neighbors, regardless of the systems they're pursuing. We'll go for coexistence. I want to ask you about the role of China and Zambia. You know, here in the U.S., we're told that, well, not here in the U.S., I'm in Lebanon, but my audience is mostly in the U.S. So in the U.S., we're often told that China has played a very negative role with its business arrangements and development projects in Zambia. And so I want to ask from your perspective, is that true? How is China perceived in Zambia versus the U.S.? And is the new Cold War between the U.S. and China, which of course the U.S. is escalating, is that playing out in Zambia at all? And what does your party believe Zambia and the African continent's relationship to China should be? There's nobody in the world today who can ignore China. Mm. There's nobody today in the world who is not dealing with China. The U.S. itself owes China billions or trillions of dollars. It owes China. Europe owes China. You go to Europe today, most of the goods come from China. You go to the U.S.A. today, many goods come from China. Who is not dealing with China? What is this obsession with Africa dealing with China? Let's be very clear. Are Africa's problems today because of China? All these centuries of colonization, dehumanization, degradation, humiliation of the African continent and the African people was by China. Was China there? No. <laughs> when did China start to emerge economically in the world and start to assert itself? It's not very long ago. Our problems are not here because of China. China is not our problem. China actually opens opportunities for us. What matters is how Africa, how Zambia and other countries engage with China. We must also bear that China has got also challenges. It's, there's no country that doesn't have challenges. China has got its own challenges and big challenges. China has got a private sector. That is not very different from the private sector of the capitalist countries. Mm. The corruption of the private sector, the capitalist private sector is the same in, with China. And some Chinese elements are good at it. Probably sometimes they beat the European countries. Mm. The Chinese government doesn't control them when they are here. And in fact, China says, the Chinese government says, deal with the corruption of those private companies operating in your country, the same way we're dealing with them here. They don't get away with the silly things in China. But because we have got cor corrupt political systems, political, corrupt political leaders in Africa, they get into, cor into corruption with the private, the private capital from China and they do crazy things. They allow them to, to continue doing wrong things. Is this a problem that we can solve? It is something that we can deal with. We can contain, but we cannot ignore China. We need to deepen our relations, with economic relations and political relations with China. And China is playing a big role in the world today, a very big stabilizing role in the world today. And China deserves support. Yes, it's got challenges, but the problems of China need our support. China is trying to deal with some of the problems it faces. It's a country that is just coming out of third world. It's a country that has just managed to eradicate poverty amid uh, the COVID pandemic. L we have more to learn from China. We have more to benefit with in dealing with China. But of course, not at the exclusion of other parts of the world. There's no country in the world today that can solve its problems all by itself. There isn't. China can't deal with its own problems by itself. The USA can't deal with problems of its problems by itself. We need cooperation with each other. 
but in a different way and in, a, in, in this new time we are in. Mm -hmm. We can't continue with colonial solutions. We can't continue with imperial domination. Uh, is everyone uh, open to, 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 to that? No. There are countries that still want to continue the old way where they dominate the whole world. Mm -hmm. And they expect the world to continue like that. Yes, they are having problems with China. China is moving at a very fast rate economically. China is making strides, is making progress that they are not matching. They are scared of China and they want us also to be scared of China. Yeah. We are not, we don't have the problem they have with China. We have actually bigger problems with them than we have with China. That's a very refreshing response. Um, yes. You know, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to end on um, something I think is very important. I wanted to ask you, you know, in countries like the US and other parts of Europe, you know, there for a long time socialism was demonized. But now it's uh, becoming increasingly popular, especially among young people, many of whom are worse off than their parents were, were despite the promise of capitalism that they were raised to believe in. So I'm wondering, is there a do you see a parallel ideological shift taking place in Zambia or even perhaps the African continent more generally, where there's an increasing popularity of socialism? Perhaps it's hopeful thinking, but I have to ask. <laughs> an ideological shift is inevitable. Mm -hmm. because of the challenges humanity faces today, which the current system, the capitalist system, is failing to solve. Capitalism is failing to deal with growing unemployment in the world. Capitalism is failing to deal with growing poverty in the world. Capitalism is failing to deal with growing inequality in the world. Every year in, in winter, they go to Davos for the World Economic Forum. What do they discuss? They're discussing these three things. Primarily, how to deal with growing inequality in the world, how to deal with a growing unemployment in the world, how to deal with growing poverty in the world, despite improved production due to improved technologies. Poverty is still deepening. Mm. Inequality is growing. Is it because the capitalist economists don't have uh, the knowledge to deal with these issues? No, they have. They have the knowledge, they've got good economists. But the problem that is there is to deal with these problems, they have to destroy capitalism. Capitalism has to go, and they are not ready to get that. So they improvise. It's like trying to square a circle. They need to deal with capitalism, but they are not ready to let it go and be replaced by another system. So they are hanging on to something that is decaying. Mm. And young people are starting to see that. They are starting to see growing unemployment in, the, in their countries. They are starting to get worried. They are starting to become uneasy. They are, they are seeing inequalities growing in their own communities. They are seeing poverty that they thought you know would be eradicated in this century, still growing, still persisting. And they are rational beings. They are starting to question the system that they live in. And this pandemic has exposed Look at how the mightiest country in the world has failed to deal with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. It was one of the worst performing. More than a million, half a million people lost. More than half a million people lost. China, where the pandemic started, look at the numbers, how low the numbers of human beings lost. Look at the socialist, those with socialist-oriented economies. Vietnam, how they have dealt with it very well. Cuba. A third world country is even producing vaccines. The vaccine that the, the Cubans have produced is ranking among the top, the top 10. Young people are seeing all this. Yes, for a long time they were not permitted. They are still not permitted to see all this. But with the flow, the easier flow of information in the world today, it's difficult to sit, to sit on these progresses. And young people are seeing for themselves. They are questioning for themselves. They are starting to see things for themselves. They are starting to analyze things for themselves. And they are starting to come to their own conclusions. It's not the label of socialist, as I said earlier. It's the form, it's the policies 
is what needs to be done or what is being done. There's no alternative right now to what is called socialist policies. Even them, they're starting to implement socialist policies in the health services. How, how are they dealing with the pandemic? They are adopting socialist policies to deal with the crisis that they are facing with the pandemic. They have not left the challenge of COVID-19 to the market forces. They have adopted socialist policies to deal with that. That's a great point. I actually hadn't thought about it that way, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Not, they don't want to call it socialist because it's offending. <laughs> but the policies they're adopting in their health services, they are socialist policies. That is exposing the failure of capitalist policies, especially on issues that really matter to human beings. Health, education, and I would say food. They are still subsidizing agriculture. But they don't want to admit it that those are socialist policies in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like vaccine, the, the vaccine campaigns in the West completely, especially in the U.S., completely government run and free. Another problem yes. with labeling them socialist policies, of course, would give a good uh, reputation to socialism, which they don't want to do. No, they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that because they still want to hang on to a moribund system. Of a course. system that is on its way out. It's inevitable. Do you, do you more do you and feel... more countries who adopt socialist policies without calling them socialist? Do you feel your campaign has a good chance? Our chances are as good as any of the top three contenders. Mm. We are among the top three contenders in these elections. Uh, we stand a chance of winning these elections. We stand a well, good chance of winning these elections. Well, uh, Fred Membe, the leader of the Socialist Party in Zambia, who is running on their ticket in the presidential elections, we will be watching um, and rooting for you. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and speaking to us about your platform and what's happening in your country. And we wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you.